Welcome to The Resilient Recruiter. This is your host, Mark Whitby. My guest today is Yosef Kolish. Yosef is the Managing Director of Leah Yosef International, an executive search firm in the wealth management space. He partners with top-tier registered investment advisors, investment management firms, trust companies, and private banks to attract and retain the top talent in the industry. Yosef reached out to me about four years ago after attending one of my webinars, and I was really impressed with him. The reason he stood out is that he was and, and is smart, ambitious, focused, and yet very humble and always seeking to learn, grow, and improve. He started out as a researcher, and he rose to become a big biller and a partner in his firm. Since then, his trajectory has continued, and if anything, it's increased. He launched his own firm in 2017. And he's already exceeded seven figures in annual billings. In this episode, you'll get to hear Yosef's story and discover what it takes to become a million-dollar producer, including the strategies, the techniques, the habits, and most importantly, the mindset. Yosef, welcome. Thank you for agreeing to do this. My pleasure. What's your take on the, the whole pandemic thing and how it's impacting business? It's interesting. So... We are part of SRA, yep. and SRA has like 100 plus firms, mm-hmm. and they're really taking a very strong leadership role. So for example, they're putting out all these really unique scripts you can use for clients and candidates to get them over the hump. Brilliant. They're putting out um, all these role playing things of what objections you're probably going to hear and how you can mm-hmm. overcome them, mm-hmm. right? And what you can say. And they're very... I would say uh, they're very subtle. They're very caring, mm. right? It's not salesy kind of stuff, right? Yeah. But it's just, it's like, wow, yeah, that's the words I was missing, right? And that's just the way, you know, so, so that's beautiful. Um, and then they're doing a lot on the business interruption, the kind of insurance and the care package, trying mm-hmm. to, you know, guide people in the right way. Mm-hmm. And then um, I have a coaching call once a week with someone there. So we're keeping up on that. So I, I kind of feel like I, I have a lot of resources and other people going through this. Like they said, there's a lot of firms that are swamp like crazy and some firms that are like, um, have to leave their industries because nothing. Mm. Um, we're not there. We're probably, uh, when it first happened, I would say half the searches went on hold. Mm -hmm. Um, now like 80% are on hold, but then new searches came in. Brilliant. So there's certain clients out there. Like one thing that really resonated, the, the president of the firm said, look, you know, there are certain clients out there that, that need you right now, that don't, yes. you know, you can't be hiding under a rock. They're like, I want a good recruiter. I want to fill stuff. So um, I heard this idea of someone say before the 10 before 10. And uh, so I just thought, okay, I got to do that. So I have, I usually don't have time to do that, but I have time. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I black out an hour to say, who am I calling yeah. in two days? And I send out an email to those people if they need some sort of introduction, yeah. some sort of reason why they would want an email. I'll give you a call in two days before 10 a.m. And then yeah. I've kind of committed myself to that. They're on my calendar. It's yeah. got to get me out of bed in the morning. And I got to make those calls. Um, and uh, it's been great. Every single day has been a lead. Fantastic. Every single day has been a, you know. So nothing is, no one said like, Hey, yeah, great. Wonderful. That's, I'm so happy you called today. But one firm said, yeah, we were, we were, we were about to call you with seven jobs. It's like, Oh, that's cool. Talk in <laughs> June. Right. So, <laughs> but, uh, you know, I just want to, I want to show I care and I want to stay on their radar. So, um, at one point I had, when I, uh, left my old firm, there was a certain point where it was, I wasn't sure which direction it was going. And I had to work, they had to do this kind of work extremely, extremely hard. And it came out, a friend of mine told me, when you, when you get out of it, you'll, you'll have all your, your first business and your second business. You'll have double because you put all this, you know. So I feel and that happened. That was true, right? So I feel like, you know, all the other stuff will come back, God willing, in the right time. And all this new stuff will take it to the next level. It's a great way of looking at things. Just one thing we hadn't mentioned was you know, there's a, there were a few projects I wanted to start in 2020 and hadn't got around to them yet. There's plenty of time <laughs> in the last few weeks. Um, one is a consulting arm, meaning that clients that would say, well, we can't hire right now, 
right? Well, no problem. Same clientele, same positions. We also offer a consulting arm. And so I made a goal for myself after listening to Mike Tietrek's class on that. Um, uh, just I'm going to ask 10 people. I'm going to ask 10 people and I'm going to build that out to the back office function, outsource the whole thing. On my third attempt so far, the client says, well, let's talk about that because we're actually not quite ready to hire. But um, And then we have some candidates who might be in transition that they would love something like that, right? Hey, you're going to hire me and give me a chance to prove myself. Um, and so, and it's the same kind of fees, same kind of numbers, the same market. So we're, we're putting out a whole marketing uh, and recruiting uh, angle for that for, for New York City. Um, and then we were talking about uh, just a lot of my searches went on hold. So uh, that's how uh, we put in with all this free time, I put in 10 before 10, which I've done in the past to get things kickstarted which means that every day for an hour in the afternoon, I will just say, okay, who are 10 people I can call in two days from now? And I'll send them an email and I'll say, hey, I know we're connected on LinkedIn and we haven't spoken in a while or whatever it happens to be. And then in two days, call them. And I'll, so I'll, get, I'll give you a call Thursday uh, before 10 a.m. if that's convenient for you. Otherwise, here's a link to my calendar. And I call and a lot of them take the call, especially these days. <laughs> <laughs> Usually they're busy, but they'll take the call. They 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 have some sort of a connection. Uh, picking in that in that ten before ten, I'm picking up so far uh, at least one lead, at least one lead, which is great. Um, and then other clients that are hot to go are are have we have had two retainers in the past week, which is which is fantastic as well. Um, there's some great scripts out there that our, our our franchise we're talking about SRA that we use has been helping with really caring scripts. Um, one that resonates really nicely is, you know, that we've been through this 10 years ago, 2008, 2009, 2010. And while a lot of the best firms stopped hiring, they never stopped interviewing. And they kind of kept the whole process moving so that they got some of the best talent. You know, how are things going for you? Um, but ultimately, I just care about people, right? Hey, how are you doing? What's going on? It's a whole different human connection right now, as opposed to I'm busy, you're trying to sell me something. I'm not trying to say anything. How's your family? You know? Um, we also are uh, doing something with called called MPC. I haven't done it often, but when I like to do things, I like to do them very systematic and very thorough. And so I've created an Excel spreadsheet of all 1,800 clients, potential hiring managers, divided that up into the 50 states and, and different regions. And as starting April 1st, every time we get a candidate, that candidate is getting an interview and we know he's good or she's good, we're now going to send an email out to the region that she's interested in, to everyone in that region, and say, hey, here's a candidate. Here's why I thought you might be interested. Here's a little bio, um, and, uh, and would you like to talk? And we're doing that through an app called Woodpecker. So three days later, they get a second email. And the second email, it's a little bit different worded. Again, it all, the wording in this is all about what's going on today, caring about them, recognizing this is not some you know, and, and Woodpecker works through my outlook, so they don't think it's constant contact. They think it's me. Everybody's, and then they, they get a third email three days later that says, um, I haven't heard from you. Does that mean you're not interested? And I uh, assume you're not interested. And, and most people respond to that, actually, with a yes or a no. So, uh, so through a nine day cycle, we're going to be able to hit uh, every candidate is now going to go out to 20 or 30 or 50, or if it's a big market, much more clients and uh, we have it divided up into potential clients and existing clients the wording is a little bit different if it's a new client and we also have it divided up to referral sources because there's a lot of referral sources as well and they're going to get a little bit of different wording and again existing referral sources and non-existing referral sources this is a whole system we've been making since january and the goal is every single interview we ask ourselves okay does this person get blasted as an mpc so um so we're trying to kind of increase revenue from that perspective uh, with, with, with minimal work. Um, and then, uh, so those are, those are some of the big projects that I'm, I'm working on. Obviously searches come in and we do have, we are blessed with, with five to fill right now. Great. So we've got to work incredibly hard on those five, you know, usually we're working on 10 or so. Um, but yeah, that's what's going on. 
All right. That was a really detailed answer. Thank you, Yosef. Um, I just want to pick up on a couple of things you said. One is you're really focusing on the, the messaging and the approach needs to be sensitive and you're just really concentrating on caring and making that human connection and um, rather than just trying to sell something. And I, I think that's absolutely critical. And if anything, I think, you know, as you said, people are maybe more receptive to taking a call or maybe they just have time. They're not in meetings all day like they were. I'm, I'm hearing that, um, you know, recruiters are actually having a better success rate reaching individuals. Maybe they're working from home or, or whatever. Um, whereas I've, from a, a whole bunch of recruiters, I've heard, oh, there's no point in calling now because the last, they don't want to hear from me. They've got more important things to focus on. And I think that's a mistake. I think your clients need you, or if even if they don't need you right now, then you need to be there for them. This is a, a time which is you know, unique and we need to show that we care. Um, so great job on that. I, I, I love it. Um, you mentioned- yeah, I was just, I was just talking with, uh, with somebody the, my 10th business development call that I was trying to make this morning. And it was a little bit of a stretch. And I heard all those voices that you just mentioned in my head. And it said, don't bother this person right now. He doesn't remember you at all. What are you going to say? So much going on. And I heard, and I was like, but I, I, I committed, I sent him an email on Thursday saying I'm going to call him before 10. That looks really bad. I, and I've got five minutes left and I've got to call this guy. So I, I called him. And, uh, of course, somebody else answered the phone. Who are you? Right. I always explain exactly who I am. I'm not playing any games. And uh, how is this person doing? Of course, we're getting, making that personal connection. Hold on. Let me see. And literally, I'm like, I hope he just goes to voicemail because I don't I just I made the call. Thank God I made the call. You can tell it's not my favorite part of my business. Um, and then he picks up the phone. And it's him. And I'm like, oh, crud. And I just you know, how's things going? We just had that human connection. It was a 30-minute call and got a contingent job order. Wow, that's awesome. You know? So it's like, and he was, and he had time. I didn't feel like he was rushing me off at all, right? So, you know, sometimes you just have to jump in. I heard an analogy once uh, that you kind of, with these business development calls, the pool is cold and you're like, you just got to figure out a way to jump in. Once you're in, you're in, right? Those 15 years, right? But how do you just jump in? So anyway, uh, it's true. Those thoughts are always in everyone, in a lot of people's heads, at least in my head, but uh, you just got to bite the bullet anyway. You know, I love that. That's such a great story. Thank you for sharing that, Yosef. And uh, I'm glad that you're human too. And you have those negative thoughts that pop into your head, just like the rest of us. So that's awesome. Um, and it just goes to show like, what if you hadn't made that call, you would have missed out on that, on that job order. Right. So Exactly. Um, what's the worst? I always like to tell people to think, what's the worst that can happen? You know, right now you don't have their business and they're not thinking about you at all. If you call them, then at least you have a chance of getting their business. And even if not, now they remember you, they know you, you have a chance to build rapport, which is never a bad, never a bad thing. Right. So, you know, so make the call. And, uh, I love also that you, um, mentioned projects that normally you don't, have time for because you're going 100 miles an hour now you can reallocate some of that time to actually improve the business so you mentioned that mpc uh process look sounds fantastic by the way i will send you i've got a really good template for those mpc emails i'm sure yours is good too but i'll send you mine just uh in case it it, it helps um and we'll talk about tech tools and tech in a bit um i don't want to I don't want to jump the gun on that. Um, I'm really interested in your interim and consulting offer because I noticed that when I checked out your website earlier today that you're really pushing that. And it's so smart because you're all, there's always opportunity, right? And maybe you just need to pivot and change your focus. You know, all, your same market, um, same prospects, same relationships, but, you know, providing a, a different solution that may be more relevant to them at this moment in time. And, and actually, which 
is a great revenue stream in the long run as well. So, um, so good thinking on that. What, um, how, how, what sort of traction are you getting on that so far? So a couple of things, uh, uh we're, I'm blessed again to be part of this amazing network. And mm-hmm. one of the people that we happened to sit down and have lunch with at our last meeting, when we still did meetings in person, uh, he turns out to be a big biller on the contract side. And so I just said, Hey, you know, what advice can you give me? And he just opened up the whole treasure chest and, and it was fantastic. And so and I kind of have him as a mentor as well. So the, what one thing that I've been told is you want to start with a, one particular market because um, if you don't have candidates in a few hours, you're out. Right. So it's not, it's a very short search. So um, I'm asking my existing clients, Hey, what are you doing in the meantime? If you have a search, you know, would you mm-hmm. consider a consultant? I'm asking mm-hmm. my existing clients, but with the going to market in one of my niches, in one of my geographies, I'm doing a search right now for all the people that are probably consultants. And there's some different ways on LinkedIn to do that. Mm-hmm. And then I also am ask, uh, I'll see what I know are consultants. I'm trying to put together at least 20 people that are on the market right now. And so I've, I've got about 10 so far just because this type of role sometimes has that, right? Um, and then I have one of my assistants, what's called pipelining them. So I've been told also that they can go off the market, right? Nice. And if you don't have someone on touch with them on a regular basis, 20 might be two, right? So that's right. fine. But if it's zero, you got a problem, right? So she's now going to be in touch with these 10 so far. I'm going to do a, a marketing campaign probably to several hundred once this gets reviewed. So I typically put a thousand at the top of my LinkedIn recruiter group. I ask my research team to narrow that down based on my criteria so I don't have to go through all thousand. They'll probably get it down to three, four hundred. And then I'll go through that again in an hour or so to try to get it down to exactly who I actually want to call and reach out to. Mm-hmm. In mail, email, uh, text them, um, voice message them with my voicemail, but I don't leave the voicemail. Somebody else will leave my voicemail. Um, uh, there's a lot of different ways we reach out to everybody over a couple of weeks. And then once we get 20, we have the clients as well all set up because the same clients, the same clients we talk to anyway. And then we're just working on those emails right now behind the scenes. So what is the messaging? So let them know that we've launched this. We have people, if they're looking, if they're interested, we're working on that. Um, and then the goal would be also to follow those emails again, three emails. Email comes out three days later, automatically it comes out again. Once they respond, it breaks the loop. Um, comes out three days later, I guess you're not interested. Moving on. And, um, uh, and then probably we'll do a, a call logic follow up for those people as well, where again, we're able to reach out, call them, and um, leave my, my voicemail in that. So that's the whole campaign we're trying to run for one particular region. And if we can get uh, somebody out, I'm be so excited. Oh my goodness. And uh, maybe do another region. You know, it's just, that's also another way to touch my, my clients. But I was told that if you reach out on purpose, not like, Hey, what are you doing in the meantime? But if you reach out on purpose and this is their first contact with you and you don't produce, it looks bad. Right. They're like, what are you doing? Like you, I, I gave you three hours. I gave you three days. This is not a search. This is not you have six weeks or 60 days. You, you, you have three hours or three days. So that's why I'm only reaching out if I actually have the people and then we can, we can get in touch with them quickly. Sounds like an awesome plan. I, I like it. And it's a beautiful, beautiful thing. If you can get, you know, five or 10 consultants out working on, you know, good day rates, then that's very lucrative business. Yeah. You know, also for me, like if uh, I, one thing I struggled for for a very long time, was what's my why mm. you know like why am i doing this yes i have thank god i have six kids and i'm so, so breadwinner i know i know money wise <laughs> that's a pretty big why I didn't right feel, there. yeah but it didn't feel good to me it was like okay. not just money right mm-hmm. and um it hit me in working with a tony robbins life coach mm-hmm. which i recommend to everybody they're incredible cool. um that it was, it was a Michael Jackson song that was always in my head since I was a little kid Okay. called uh, Heal the World. Yes. I actually was almost a doctor. I'm, I'm a medical school dropout. Okay. Right? So I went to medical school. So, but it's like, wait a minute, I, I can actually heal, change people's lives yeah. in such incredible ways. And when I hit on this 
kind of, hey, this idea of this contract business, you know how, how healing that is? All these people, the people I'm calling after are mostly out of work. I mean, the best thing to do, I've been told, is to find someone that this is their living, right? They always do this. They love yes. being a contractor. Hey, a month or two before they're done, they're looking for more. Yeah. There's not that many of them. And even then would love full-time work. Um, but there's a lot of people I talk to in this space that are in between. And this is an amazing, amazing opportunity. Plus, people are hurting right now, but but can't can't find the budget to do full time and pay my fee and things like that. So I feel like it fits really right in with my mission and doesn't take it away from what I'm trying to uh, build in the first place. It's all the same clients and candidates. Love it. That's powerful, man. Have you read um, Start With Why by Simon Sinek? Absolutely. All yeah, right. he's great. He's fantastic. That's a, that's a really good one, isn't it? Um, so you said a couple of things there that were really interesting. One is you said someone else will leave your voicemail. Could you explain that? Yeah, so I record a voicemail on yep. a system called Call Logic. Okay. And um, and then I'll have my assistant uh, hop on a phone and it will call automatically, let's say, 100 people. I could probably go to 100 people in let's say two hours, three hours. Okay. And as long as she doesn't hang up the phone, it just keeps dialing. Um, and uh, if someone doesn't answer or they answer and you know, hey, I'll put you into the voicemail. Once she gets the voicemail, she presses the button and it drops in my voicemail. If someone actually answers the phone, she's prepared with a very, very simple script of, um, of uh, you know, this is who I'm calling about. And, and why I'm calling, would you be interested in a conversation? And if they say no, she says, that's fine. Is that you know, no for now? Or would you not want to hear from us again? Very, very simple. I don't want to bother. She's actually an executive assistant. She's not a recruiter. Nobody I'm training to do this kind of stuff. Um, but I, I, whenever she runs a campaign, I get calls back. People call me back. I don't know who they are. And they call my voicemail. They leave me messages or I answer the phone. And obviously I know who they are because I was, I was sending them something on LinkedIn not too long ago through an in-mail, but, um, but it's great. It, 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 it's, I feel like on the one hand, it's not very powerful. Like we did one deal last year from Call Logic, okay. but on the other hand, it's one deal. Right. <laughs> yes. You know, and it's a different, it's a different touch point and you never know where the person's going to come from. Yes. So I and that it, one I deal, I mean, that could become a repeat client, right? So the lifetime value exactly. of one new client is high. Um, it's interesting. I have another client that uses, I think it's called cloud call. It sounds similar. It integrates with bullhorn, but you, you need to, you need to line up all the calls, right? You need to call lists and then you go through it. Or So it integrates with, it integrates with PCR. This PCR. One, okay. What yeah. I use. So basically um, my team in India mm -hmm. will, from my LinkedIn group that I reached out to and I in mail, let's say 150 people, they'll find me in an Excel spreadsheet and populate it with their as best they can direct dial numbers, cell phones, emails, things like that, personal emails. They have a lot of tools they use for that. They give me an Excel spreadsheet. This Excel spreadsheet gets imported into PCR. Yeah. And then the Call Logic campaign takes from that PCR list. Got it. Yeah. And so it's just it's exactly like it should look at PCR. And it, I could be fancy with it. It could update back and forth and do a lot of different things. I just, I don't do, I don't do all that much with it. We just do cool. like a, a one, one shot deal, leave one message. All right. I like it. So, um, look, this leads us on to something I wanted to ask you about anyway, which is I, all of the top producers I speak to are very focused and very intentional about where they invest their time. And you are obviously doing quite a lot of outsourcing. You've got people offshore that you're delegating certain tasks to. Could you, um, Explain what do you personally focus your time on and what do you outsource and delegate to assistants or, or offshore res, uh, researchers? Sure, sure. Um, I focus my time um, on anything that has to do with deals, mm -hmm. uh, anything that has to do with my clients and interacting with my clients. I don't set interviews. Somebody else sets interviews for me. Um, Reaching out to candidates if I know they're interested, if they responded, mm -hmm. uh, but only once. Somebody else, if they don't respond at that point or they missed the call that we were supposed to set up, somebody else then tries to follow up to get them, see if they're still interested. Um, 
and uh, at, I would say high level strategy. Mm -hmm. So for example, once I said, okay, we're, we've got to do this MPC business. We've got to do this consulting business. I realized this is a lot of time, effort, and energy. So my 24-7 team, which had been working for, let's say, um, my, I have one guy there working 20 hours a week, but I can scale that. So I said, I need you to work 45 hours a week. I need you to have Megan also work 45 hours a week. So now it's 90 hours coming from India at $7 an hour. Okay. And then my, my VA, my virtual assistant, I said, I want you to run that. I have an intern too to help me with this. I want you to manage it. So you're my touch point. This is very, very important. So we do something called stand-up meetings, 15 yeah. minutes a day. It's, we just want to keep moving this along. We've got, we've got goals that are um, you know, very time-crunched, time-limited goals. We want to get to stage one by this date. Here's how we're going to do it. And then I let her run with it, and we check in, right? And so this contracting business, I'm kind of the, the think tank behind it and pushing it forward. But I want everybody else to do all the work. I don't want to look for emails. I don't want to look for phones. I don't want to look for, I don't want to organize anything. I don't want to send any emails out. I don't want to run any mass email marketing, any mass sort of marketing. I do my emails right now um, because um, I don't know. It's just the first touch point. I want to make sure it's the people that I like. Mm -hmm. But uh, if, if I get blocked where I have, let's say, several hundred people I need to email at once, it's going to take me hours to do it once at a time because sometimes you get blocked. You can't do mass emails. Uh, I'm considering having someone else, you know, sit at my desk, uh, or my home desk when I'm not working, whatever, and uh, and do that for me. And I have other people running basically anything that anyone else can possibly do, that I can give 20 minutes of training and they can do it for 25 hours over the course of the year. That is awesome. That is that is what I want to do. So I I really just find myself trying to say, okay, what searches do we have on? I have a search checklist of, okay, a job comes in, you print out the job what the job is in writing that the client signed off on. He agreed, this is the job. This is the marketing piece. This is what's required. This is the money I'm going to pay. They must sign off on that. And that starts off our checklist. And I'm going through every single checklist, but it's not just me doing the work. It's who else is doing this work so this, is, so this can be happening. But I'm running that piece of it. And so at any given moment in time, there's always some people, some things to be, to be moving along in this process. Love it. That's amazing. How do you manage and keep track of all the stuff that's happening uh, that you're not personally doing each task? Go safe. Great question. Great question. So I'll give you like a five minute answer to that. Okay. Okay. Go for it. So <laughs> one thing at a time. Uh, over here on my desk mm -hmm. is a first interview. It's just literally a piece of paper, yeah. a notepad, first interviews. So first interviews I put down there. Over here is a little scorecard on my desk. Number six, so I'm trying to get 14 on a monthly basis, and that's kind of my accountability. Uh, so I'm up to, I'm up to, I have to count down. Start with 14, six left oh, awesome. for first interviews. Mm -hmm. um, over here in the middle of my desk is all the things that are actually happening, um, actual searches, actual names, uh, contingent searches over there, and kind of who's going on real time right there. Um, over here is a folder bin. And in each bin is uh, these. This is the exactly what's required for the candidate, okay. exactly the marketing piece, and my checklist printed out, stapled together, going through the checklist. Um, on my Google, when I open up Google, it opens up um, a number of pages automatically. So the first page it opens up is my PC recruiter. The second page it opens up is a tool called Red Booth. In Red Booth, I have three columns in here. One is all the candidates I submitted, which I can slide them along if they're about to submit. Now, to submit, submitted, and to set the interview. So if they have to submit them, I write their name down. Once I submit them, I slide them along. Once they get interviewed, I slide them to the interview process. They don't get off there until somebody sets the interview. Um, then I have Woodpecker. Woodpecker is my email marketing campaign. And I have a person who runs that needs to put in here all the campaigns that are going on and they're color coded. So are they happening? Are they running? There's a bunch of tabs here so I can look at any point what's running, what's on deck. Call logic, same thing. Person who runs that is is running the call logic and telling me what's on deck. Um, I have I have a lot of jobs on Indeed and a lot yeah. of jobs on LinkedIn. Somebody else 
uh, I post those. Somebody else renews them. Um, but I like to be involved in the nuancing of the posting, and I'm paying a lot of money for them. Um, and But when they, somebody else goes to those applications and screens them for my instructions and puts them on an Excel spreadsheet. So that Excel, Excel spreadsheet opens up, and I can check them when I want, and tell them, you know, yes, no, maybe so, whatever, right? And they either make the files or don't make the files. Um, and somebody else can go and reach out to those people because they're pretty low-hanging fruit, and they pretty much respond right away. So I try to just keep a tab on what's happening through those different media. Wow, awesome. You've got a lot of moving parts there, but it, uh, it's you're building a machine, which I like, um, so that you don't have to do every part yourself. Um, have you looked at using an online project manager like Trello or Basecamp or Teamwork, something like that? Yeah, Red Booth is like Trello. Oh, Red, Red Booth is like I Trello. Try, I okay. tried Trello. Yeah. Yeah, it's like Trello. I, I don't have uh, my other people on my team use it also. They like their own thing. And as long as they're okay with it and I'm okay with it, that's fine. It's just for me. Okay. Um, but, uh, you know, I was told the SRA likes this and so they gave it to me. So it mm -hmm. could... It could theoretically work with a lot of people if I wanted to. It's scalable. Yes. I use a tool called Teamwork. It's a, it's a software out of Dublin, Ireland, teamwork.com. But I make everybody log in there. We track the tasks they have to check off when they're done. Any instructions or comments, questions go back and forth there so that, um, A, it's all in one place because that's the way my brain works. I want to see everything in one place. But B, if I had to replace someone or if I needed to train a new person, then it, all of the documentation is already on there. So it makes it easier and easier. And as we refine processes and different projects, then, um, you know, all the latest versions are, are there. So that's the way I personally like to run that. Right, right. My, my Indian team is a different company. So I feel like, hey, yeah. that's how they want to work it. And, uh, so, and one time somebody did leave and there was zero, zero downtime. Cool. And, um, my my virtual assistants are also a different company, so I like them to work how they like to work. And again, okay. one time somebody left, and there was zero downtime. So, Good. you know, I'm happy with them just doing it how they. I don't really have employees over here. Fair enough. You mentioned is it uh, headhunting twenty four seven? That's who you use for research or yeah twenty four yeah twenty four seven yeah, yeah I've spoken to those guys. How do you find them? Um, for what I ask them to do, mm -hmm. they're great. Right. So if you ask them to do the same thing a zillion times, yeah. they're, they're, they're fine with that. Right. Um, if you so if you're willing to spend a few hours with them and mm -hmm. get them all up to speed and fix some mistakes here and there, they will go for years like the energizer bunny. But if it's something new or something that requires some interesting thinking or communicating with my clients directly, I mean, that's not really what they're up, to, up for. Got it. No, that makes, that makes total sense. Um, Yusuf, I kind of got, we got carried away on attention there, but I'd really love to hear your story. Could you just, uh, could we take a step back and like talk about how did you get yourself from being a research associate to a top producer? Uh, obviously the highlights because, you know, what you've achieved in a, in a relatively short career is pretty remarkable. Sure. Uh, give me a time frame. I'll, I'll keep myself to a certain time. Oh, like How the five minute version. And then I'll ask you, you know, questions that come out. Great. Of that. So um, I started as a part time executive assistant. Okay. Um, and within about six months was promoted to um, kind of, you know, still someone who can make calls. You might, you might call a junior recruiter. Mm -hmm. And I did that in 2006, 2007, 2008, 2009, 2010. Um, 2011. About that time, I started to say, you know, I think I could use some more income over here. <laughs> like, what is it like to be a recruiter, you know? Um, so I started and there was some technology tools. I took a, I took a class called Colby, Colby Test, K-O-L-B-E. Okay. And Colby is all about using your instincts. Mm -hmm. So I put you in, t in a maze. Basically, if I know your Colby score, I'll know exactly how you're going to get out of that maze. So I learned a lot about myself from this Colby test. And I learned that the way that I was approaching the business was not how I instinctually approached the business. And I started to use my instincts instead to solve problems. And I, one particular 
search for a very well-known client, which was always going on because it was contingent. I found some tools and tricks and technology to fill four people that year and make over $100,000 in, in revenue for the firm. And um, I, you know, I wasn't paid on that, but I said, hey, could I be a recruiter? So at that point, um, after six months of running that, we hired somebody else into my junior assistant kind of seat. And I started moving into the recruiter realm. Um, at that point, Next Level Exchange was launched through uh, SRA, and that was basically opening up a, a whole world of every trainer that wanted to be part of that, and there was so much in there, and I spent easily 100 hours just trying to learn and better my skills and also trying to, again, use my strengths. Um, so I started to track my billings at that point. In 2012, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, and I heard this idea of a, of a, a million dollar biller. And I was like, I want to be that. Like, what is that? You know? And they were once a month interviewing these million dollar billers. And I'm like, what are they? Who are these people? And they're regular people talking for 20 minutes about, you know, I'm like, well, I want to do that. So um, it was just a little bit more every year. That's what I would say. It's a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more. Um, I will say that the Tony Robbins life coaching, I do a lot of coaching uh, with, with recruiter coaching, but I never did life coaching and that took it to the next level. And that was able to take it to basically double, right? And get me over that mark. And, but because there was a lot of emotional hurdles that I think people might not realize that they have in terms of uh, achieving what they're looking to achieve and why they have these goals. And it was almost a part of it was kind of letting go of the goal to kind of reach the goal. And um, that was extremely, extremely helpful. So um, I, I can definitely say I'm a different person after going through that, that process. And uh, that's kind of how, you know, in 2017, I, I, part of what I said, that's, you know, the only way to get these goals happening are to start my own company and, uh, franchise is sounds like an amazing way to do it. I'm doing it over here. But um, that's kind of, you know, from 2005 to 2020, 15 years later. Amazing. Thank you for, for sharing. That's, that's so cool. What I liked about that story is, number one, you were the driver of that, right? You were very, uh, you took responsibility for your own development. Um, you decided what you wanted and then you figured out, well, what do I need to do in order to achieve that? And um, so I think that separates, most recruiters don't do that. They just, whatever their company gives them as far as training, they just, they take that and they say, okay, good. I'm trained now, I know what I'm doing. I don't need more training, right? Um, whereas the top producers I find are always constantly working on themselves, working on their mindset, working on their own development. And then you took that one step further with Tony Robbins, um, Sorry, did you want to say something about that? Yeah, you know, I saw a video last night my son put in my hands. It's so encouraging for people who want to be a million-dollar producer. So I wanted to share this. Yeah. He wants to play college basketball. Okay. And, um, you, know, every, you know, people will oftentimes say, you know, you're right, right? You want to get a scholarship for college basketball? You're right. So he showed me a video. And this is a famous trainer. And this guy said, there are 500,000 people playing high school basketball. You think you're going to play college basketball? Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. There's only 100,000 of those that actually want to play college basketball. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. They want to, but there's only 20,000 that actually will do the right things and have a plan to play college basketball. And by the way, there's 19,000 seats in college basketball. So if you have a plan and you do the right things, you have close to a 90% chance of being a college basketball player. Right. And this is from someone who was five nine and played college basketball. Right. Wow. So I would say the same thing. How many recruiters out there are just playing? Are just kind of you know yeah I'm just doing my own thing. How many actually care about being a million dollar producer? Right. And if you actually care and you're doing the right things consistently and you work and you have a plan, you can you it can you can happen before you even realize it. Absolutely. That's a great story. I, I love that. How old's your son? He's thirteen. Cool. But he is 5'11", so he does have a shot. <laughs> wow, absolutely. That's amazing. And um, I uh, 
my dad got me into Tony Robbins when I was about 17. My dad's a psychiatrist and he did NLP training and then he came across Tony Robbins. And I, so I have like an old, somewhere in my garage, I've got like the old, original cassette tape of personal power. Um, and then have you done the firewalking seminar and least the power within? Oh, no, you should try it, man. It's, uh, it's pretty, it's pretty awesome. So, um, you have done an amazing job of sharing your story, uh, breaking down like what you concentrate on, what other people, what you get other people doing. What does a typical day kind of look like for you, Yosef? Like how many hours are you working and then what do you like, what are you doing during those hours? Yeah. So, um, I start with a Sunday. Mm-hmm. Sunday, I try to still get up early okay. and do some spiritual practices and then try to talk with maybe my, my, one of my virtual assistants, what's going on, especially if we have like some important, just administrative work to do. Mm-hmm. Um, other administrative work I can squeeze in. Certain projects need to be done. Um, and a couple hours on a Sunday, I can kind of set the tone. Don't always get to do that, but I like to for mm-hmm. the week. Um, Monday, I'm up usually around six. I'm at work usually around eight. Um, do some, again, spiritual practices in the middle. Um, I usually go straight to work. And then I'm in work till about 5.30 or 6. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't, I eat through, I work through lunch. I don't like to leave the office. I have a stand-up desk and a move stool uh, from Varier. And so I actually don't sit still all day. So I don't have, uh, I used to, it's caused some back problems, but I stand up and I walk around the wireless headset, four monitors, just very comfortable and moving around in the office a lot. Um, and then that's, uh, go to home around 536. I try not to look at emails or take calls in the evening. It's very distracting. Um, and I'm distracted and I find I'm not at my best. If I have to, I will. But, um, I, I know that it can cause issues both ways with the family and also, you know, at work. Um, and then I do that Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, leave, leave a little bit early, maybe on average like four or so. Um, no work on Saturday or Saturday night. So that's kind of, that's kind of my deal. And uh, everything just kind of squeezes in there somehow. Amazing. You know, some, you see, I mean, you're working hard, obviously, but you have very clear parameters around things. I find some big builders tend to be alcohol, uh, not alcoholics, workaholics. Maybe they're alcoholics too, but um, workaholics is the word I meant to say. You've got six kids. How do you balance like being a great dad and everything else that you've got going on in your life? You, I noticed you did martial arts and various other things. How do you make it all fit? Um, oh, my, my wife is available all the time, right? She's uh, work at, at home, uh, actually homeschool the kids, wow. which is good for, yeah, it's good for this environment. Cause they're like, well, all my other friends are home too. We can play video <laughs> games all day together. Right. But, cool. uh, but yeah, it's, it's a, it's a lot going on in the house. Um, well, we have Saturday, I'm, I'm, I'm yeah. pretty traditional, uh, religious. So we, we have that downtime there from Friday night to Saturday night, no technology, mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I've tried to put the little ones to bed. The older ones, uh, you just, you know, they, you never know when they're going to want to talk. It could be 10 o'clock at night, could be like one o'clock in the morning, uh, be available, um, and be interested in what they're interested in. So, uh, but I mean, from six o'clock at night to, you know, midnight, plenty of time, you know, for between my wife and the kids and whatnot, you know, as long as I'm not fiddling around with my phone, like right now, it's like, oh my goodness, what's going on with Corona? Like you could spend your whole life on your phone today, right? Absolutely. Like putting, put it, put it away, you know, and just, and just be present. Then, um, then I find that it's, uh, it works out. But if I, if I start making a lot of calls at one point I was working West coast, but, Oh, I gotta, I gotta be available from nine to 10 and talk to people on the West coast. It doesn't, it doesn't really work for me, you know? So, yeah, we do need people to work with my schedule and people respect that. I mean, my clients respect it. They're like, Hey, it's after five thirty. I don't expect you to be working. Um, but then again, I'll have a lot of times where I say this and I'm, I, I just need to be at work till six thirty or seven. I just, something's going on, uh, several times a month. Like I just, I got to put in, you know, it, 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 it's just not, it's not, it's not typical. Awesome. It sounds like you're, you're doing a great job of managing all those, all those different aspects. 
You've mentioned a few people I wanted to give a shout out to. One is um, you mentioned SRA, so Jeff K. Shout out to him. Great, uh, you know, great guy, and you know, lo- huge amount of knowledge on our industry. Um, you mentioned Ten Before Ten. I've actually got written an article about that. This is super old school, though. Like people don't like Ten Before Ten anymore. But I will link in the show notes to that article if people want to adopt this practice, at least for a finite period of time to kind of get back to basics. And um, I believe that activity is the solution. You know, you need to, your ratios might suck right now based on what's going on in the world. But, you know, if you think of this as you're running, you've got a farm to manage, you've got, you mentioned 1800 prospects on your list or whatever, you know, if you're not planting those seeds and watering them and nurturing them, then you know, guess what? We're going through winter right now, but spring always follows winter. And if you haven't done any work, you know, in the in the meantime, you're not going to have any harvest. So, you know, we need to keep keep at it. So I love that. Um, is there anyone else you wanted to give a shout out to that's been influential in your career? Or, I mean, there are so many people who've who've put their best work on Next Level Exchange. It's just incredible, and their best tips and their best secrets, like the gift that keeps on giving, different strategies that we've used over the years to negotiate. Oh, that's really important. I'm working with, um, negotiating is something that, it's something that's so important in our industry, but like our, I feel like the skills aren't there. And at least for me, it doesn't come natural. And I always, I'm like a checklist kind of guy. What am I supposed to do next? And every time I talk to a trainer about it, you know, go with the flow, try this, try that. Like, I don't want to go with the flow. Try. What, what am I doing? Where am I? So I went with a, um, I, I read this book called Never Split the Difference. Oh, yeah. I've, which is an F. I've heard of that. I've not read it yet. FBI negotiator. Super incredible read. Uh, really hard to make practical, though. I went okay. to a conference and he had a speaker there. Mm-hmm. And the speaker, uh, Todd Camp, okay. never say, I'm mean, sorry, start with no. Okay. Start with no. So read that book, talk, called Todd Camp, and, and Todd and I work together on a weekly basis. Cool. So whenever I get stuck in a difficult time, he's got a system. Hey, here's where you are. This is the next right step and why. And he guides me through whether it's collections, whether it's through closing on a retained search, whether it's through getting a candidate over the line. And it's just all of those critical pieces i'm learning on the way as well like this is not your gut feel this is a science and it's it's fantastic so not that he always has the answer remember one time he's like listen just look you're not in control anyway let him go at it (laughs) right (laughs) you know uh and it turned out that they uh they closed the deal right but it's that was like very very rare that he'll do things like that I don't, and it, so so have him in my corner as well so shout out to todd camp we're trying to get him to do a training for the whole sra if possible wow you really focus on self-development you know, safe so that's that's cool i can see why you've been why you've been so successful um I noticed you, you've done a great job on vid, creating videos, by the way, with your video blog. I wanted to ask you about that um, because you created some fantastic videos. You did, I mean, uh, what's among the best, I would say, the best video production quality that I've seen. But I noticed you didn't continue it. What, what was your decision to make videos? And then what was your decision to not make videos? You're very interesting right now because I'm... <laughs> I might just call it my company and, and get back into that. So I'm trying to figure out what is the, you know, the, the, the magic pill for getting new jobs in the door. Mm-hmm. Okay. I don't have that right now. So that's why I'm doing 10 before 10. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Cause that's, that's hard medicine to swallow. Right. But I'm still always looking for that. So I, tr- what, at one point it was get viral. And I said, maybe that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to make two videos a month. I'm going to send them out to my database. Mm -hmm. Nobody looked at them. Nobody Uh cared about them. I did it for a year. I didn't get even people, you know, nothing, right? Um, However, um, in December, Mm -hmm. somebody called me who I've been working on for a year and said, you know, I saw some of your videos. I really like them. So 
I feel like I know you already. Mm, exactly. And we made, and we made twenty thousand dollars off of that, right? So um, I probably should call them and re-engage. Uh, it's a slow. Everything is slower than you like. I'm working with linked selling right now. Oh yes. Link selling has taught me how to. Um, they did it for me for seven months, and now I'm taking over. Yeah. So what? What? How? What did they do? They got me two conversations. Mm-hmm. Well, a lot of conversations, but two very big ones with some very, very large clients. Right, some of the largest in my industry. Call it, you know, top twenty with the CEOs of those companies wanting to talk with me and having more followed conversations. Let's see if we can retain you on searches. Right. Why? Because of their tools of how they approach it. So now we're taking that over. But again, that's drip marketing. Yeah. That's you know certain amount of messages to certain people in certain ways and certain yeah. times through LinkedIn. So I'm trying that. I thought that would be, wow, that would be my next thing after Get Viral, which is the video tool that we used, Get Viral. Um, I think it was with a V-Y-R-E-L, Get Viral. Mm-hmm. Again, I heard, from it, I heard about it from, yeah, from uh, Mike Pytre- Petrek also. Mm-hmm. Um, but, uh, but again, it's seven months later and have I been retained in anything? No. But am I going to stop? No way. I see the results. So I'm probably going to jump back in with get viral just because. You, you know, know what? Here's, <laughs> here's my take on it. Yo safe is, um, of course it depends. Choosing the right topics for your videos is really important. And no, like knowing what your mo- making sure they address your market's pain points rather than just what you think, you know, you want to talk about. So syncing up the right topics is important. But having said that, any content you put out there, I think is positive, but it's like going to the gym. Like you can't go and work out once and then look in the mirror and see a difference, right? You won't see any difference. And, and it, instead of getting discouraged, like I've been doing this for three weeks and I've not, you know, I still look the same. It's you need to keep, putting in the reps and the, and the, and the time of the gym, because after a period of weeks and months and quarters, pretty soon, like you, you turn around and you've, you've had a transformation. I think video is like that. And then when you are doing the calls, I always tell people it should be multi-touch, multi-channel. So if you've, you've sent the LinkedIn message, you know, you've sent the, they've received their voice, your voicemail, they've seen your videos, maybe you send them an NPC, they didn't respond. Then you call them it's not a cold call. They know who you are. They've heard your voice. They've seen your video. You know, it's, it all is cumulative so that it, um, it does build a relationship over time. That's kind of my, my take on it. So I would encourage you to go for it. You did, you, you were doing an awesome job. Thank you. So, um, I think I've, I've asked you everything I wanted to ask you. Is there anything I should have asked you, but I didn't. <laughs> No, I think this is fantastic. I hope this is helpful. I hope this is uh, encouraging for people who are trying to uh, get through these times and and build for the future as well. And um, and just you know, just just like you, like you said, just keep at it. Just uh, if if the things go on pause, things go on hold, there's always something to be building, to be doing, to be calling, to be talking to people. You never know where it's going to go. I'm just surprised so many times on these ten before ten calls how many people are actually answering before when I did it last year compared, it was not like this. It was not like this. So people just want to know how you doing, right? And how, and how are, how's your family and how you making out? And, um, and then of course, whatever, whatever, by the way, you know, what, what can we keep you in, in, in mind for as things go? Well, here's what we're really looking for. Here's what's always hard for us. And you already have the icebreaker like we talked about before. It's just, how are you? Right. Absolutely. Yo, Safe, this has been awesome. Thank you so much for taking the time. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. I look forward to doing it again anytime and uh, success with everything. Call anytime. Take care. Thank you so much. Take care. All the best. Bye-bye.